Good to see you. How are you? Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Very taped down. Goodness, I'm never going to do this way. Oh, is Councilman McPherson here? I didn't know that. All right. Is everyone ready? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, today, I knew, uh, I know that there's a city council hearing at one o'clock um, where uh, Cure Violence is going to sort of give a presentation and, you know, maybe do a, a deeper dive into what the program is all about, introduce the violence interrupters and just sort of have a more of a public conversation about uh, this initiative. Uh, and that's, first of all, it gives us a hard stop <laughs> for our gathering here right now. But I thought it would make some sense to try to give you in the media, you know, maybe a little more kind of one-on-one -on -one time uh, with our team than you otherwise might get during a public hearing, depending on how long it goes, you might have to go. So the idea was just to kind of do this first and then let you get down to the, uh, the council hearing. Uh, last September, um, we um, made the decision to uh, attack gun violence uh, as a public health issue, as a public health crisis. Um, th there's a lot of reasons we did that, uh, uh, and there are a lot of steps involved in uh, trying to treat uh, any contagious disease. Uh, but if we believe that gun violence um, is a health problem and is contagious, uh, that we wanted to be um, aggressive and frankly, and creative uh, in trying to solve this problem. Um, over the last year and a half, two years, we've seen a spike uh, in violence across the country. Um, talking to uh, uh, the two folks here from Cure Violence, um, you know, there's, of course, they're seeing it all over the country in the cities they work with. And their judgment, the spike in violence is clearly a, uh, a byproduct of. Uh, the pandemic we're going through. Um, and, and so I have noticed now other cities and states in the last six weeks, two months, have started to talk about gun violence uh, as a public health issue. Because we were, because we did so a little earlier, last uh, September, um, we, uh, you know, we had the benefit perhaps of a, a head start on a number of other cities and states that are only now looking at this problem this way. Uh, and so we're here today maybe just to do a little bit of a summary of where we've been uh, in the last uh, six months, but then more importantly, where we're going. And I think if there's um, uh, an important milestone that is happening uh, to being announced today, and we'll start next week, is that um, the violence interrupters um, who are here, and, and we're gonna introduce them and uh, talk about what their role will be. They start on Tuesday. Um, that's an important step in this process, but, but we didn't want to miss this opportunity to kind of give a, 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 a larger overview on our thinking 
and all the things we've been doing. So we announced last fall that we're going to treat this as a public health issue. We contracted with a group called uh, Cure Violence, um, which is a, uh, a, a, a global uh, organization, frankly, uh, that's been around for 20 years, works with cities and jurisdictions all over the world, uh, including countless cities across the country. We con City Council approved the ordinance. We contracted with them at the beginning of the year. Um, obviously, Jawan came on as the director uh, of the initiative shortly thereafter. Uh, he's going to talk here in a moment about sort of the things that uh, he's been working on in the last six months. And then uh, we're going to transition during this news conference and then talk about the role the violent interrupters play. So with that sort of run of show, um, I think I'm going to turn it over to Juwan right now so he can sort of talk about what the last six months have meant for him, some of the things he's been focused on, and then I'll take the podium again and then we'll dive into uh, uh, a conversation about the next phase of this, the evolution of everything we've been trying to do, uh, which is uh, with the violence interrupters. So, Juwan. Thank you, Mayor. So it's been a um, very eventful six months. Um, we've been able to get uh, a number of things accomplished. We still have a lot of work to do. Um, our starting with our summer rec program, uh, we've seen outstanding numbers from, from participants, um, including our, our partners who have helped us in this, in this cause. Um, I wanted to highlight Mike Robb and Fourth and Goal who provide our football camps and um, our, our youth summit so we can get the information from the community. A lot of individuals want to be at the table, but a lot of times we miss out on input that young people have to provide to what we're trying to address. So having that youth summit um, was outstanding and, and I appreciate the particip participation from all our community partners. Um, our Seven Mindset Curriculum, another program, would not have been as successful as it was without our community pa partners. Eric Williams from uh, Wayman Palmer YMCA provided an opportunity for young people, juniors and seniors in high school, freshmen in college, to be trained um, with the Seven Mindset Curriculum. Harvard was able to pay these young people for working and then disseminating information to various summer programs throughout the city. Um, IMA was gracious enough to provide transportation um, from th for these people to get from uh, Wayman Palmer to their various sites and work sites um, throughout the city and I'm extremely pre uh, appreciative of that. And again, without these partners and collaborations, we would not have been able to be as successful as we were. Um, we've had a series of community meetings and town halls to gain information from the community in regards to what they're seeing. I continually encourage everybody and say that, you know, no one can come into a community and say that they have the answers to address or reduce gun violence. But what we can do is ask what the community members and individuals from these communities are seeing and get their input as we create the plan and roll that out. Um, meeting with service providers from uh, across, the, uh, across the city, uh, mainly grassroots agencies. Um, I know the Unisons, the Zephs, the Harbors, they have a huge task on their hands and they're working, but we don't want to leave out those grassroots agencies that are boots on the ground and deal with uh, the communities that are impacted the most by violence. Um, planning and coordinating with uh, C, uh, CJCC, uh, TPD, community groups, um, neighborhood organizations and more um, again, only proves and supports the goal of what we're trying to do is to create a collaborative effort. No one person can take, take on this task. As we see across, as you guys know, a, as most of the individuals in the community know, gun violence is going up across the country. Um, and so with that, it'll take a community effort uh, to address what we're seeing. Um, and continuing partnerships, uh, also I, I, I can't miss out on our community volunteers who have been instrumental in our parks. Having so many parks and pools open this summer, there was an incident of violence um, regarding the gun, uh, after our community, uh, community volunteers stepped into action, we haven't had one incident of violence at the parks that they oversaw. Um, and I, I, I commend those individuals because they did it from uh, just their concern about wanting to keep our, safe, our kids safe and our community safe. Um, so now with their assistance, they also were encouraged um, to create a plan to roll out to make sure our schools is safe. We'll be active in, in schools, we'll be active around schools, ensuring that our kids are getting home safely um, after schools, and that is a result of our community volunteers and their willingness just to be active um, and part participatory in, in our initiative. Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to the mayor. All right, so as I mentioned earlier, um, we've been working with Cure Violence uh, uh, for the better part of calendar year 2021. Um, again, I mentioned it's a global organization. 
its goal is to stop, uh, interrupt, calm, mediate, uh, whichever word you want to use, but to intervene in a situation before it becomes violent. And we have, what everything we're doing with Juwan and what we're about to talk about with the uh, violence interrupters is part of their model. We're following their curriculum. In some ways you can look, think of us as students uh, uh, you know, in a seminar and we're following the CURE violence curriculum. It has worked in so many other places that we wanted to embrace it here. Um, the focus in particular is on the highest risk uh, populations, the, high, the individuals that, that not only we believe, but that data suggests are, the, um, are at the highest risk. And what we find uh, is that there are two things uh, that high risk individuals um, that can compel high risk individuals to turn to gun violence. Two things. One is a sense of grievance. Um, maybe, uh, you know, they, they were, you were wronged, uh, something was done to you, you felt that you weren't respected, maybe someone's talking to your girlfriend or whatever it may be. There's some grievance that you feel. But the second thing um, that happens with high risk individuals it's not just that they feel a grievance, we all feel grievances, you know, in our lives. It's the belief that they, ha they feel that the only way to respond to this grievance uh, is with violence and that an act of violence is the justified way to respond to the grievance. That is, um, that's what we're trying to prevent. Um, the team, the violence interrupters and others, are going to you know interrupt, calm, mediate, stop these situations without any value judgment. Uh, with there will be no uh, uh, sense of who's right, who's wrong. You know this person was right. No, he really didn't talk to my girlfriend. That's not their, their role. Isn't to pass moral judgment. It's just to stop the violence. It is important to uh, note um, that including Juwan, but, but um, everyone involved in the cure violence model, and today if we're talking about the violence interrupters, very specifically them, they are not police. This is not the police. They do not do police work. There is no intersection with their work and police work. When there's an incident and they have the yellow police tape, they're not allowed on the other side of that yellow tape either. This is totally different and separate from police work. There is no interaction. It's just different. This is a resource that we believe will help policing and help the police department, but these are not police officers, don't do police work, and will not be, um, in, you know, they're not informants, they're not, it's just different. It's a totally different thing that they're doing. Um, cure violence, looking at data, um, and that is how we make decisions in my administration, it is data-based. Um, they have recommended, um, as a start, uh, that we hire fire four violence interrupters and have them begin in the Inglewood Junction neighborhood. Um, and so that's what we did, and that's what we're doing. Um, they will work Tuesdays to Saturdays. Um, they start next Tuesday, August 31st. Generally speaking, they're going to work second shift, although it strikes me that this is a job that will probably uh, be a 24-7 sort of responsibility in a lot of ways. Technically, um, you know, their shift will be 4 to midnight or you know, so something along those lines. They'll have an office here. They will also have an office at the Frederick Douglass Community Center. Um, it is our expectation, again following data, that we will hire um, additional violence interrupters for additional neighborhoods um, you know, after this initial phase. So I think though no decisions have been made uh, with, uh, with clarity yet, I think generally speaking, we're looking at those neighborhoods that we have already targeted with ShotSpotter. So Junction Englewood has ShotSpotter. The first four violence interrupters have been assigned to that neighborhood will work there. There are two other areas where we have ShotSpotter. Um, the North End and East Toledo vaguely uh, defined. 
though I don't know that we're announcing it here yet at this moment, it is very likely that the next two waves of violence and erupters um, would be assigned to East Toledo and, and the North End to sort of overlay with our shot spotter operation. That doesn't necessarily mean that there will be 12. We have four here. It's not necessarily the case. That'll be four in East Toledo and four over there. But it is certainly the case that these are not, uh, these will not be the only violence interrupters. They are merely the first. Uh, they're, they're simply the first. And, and we wanted uh, to introduce them and to talk about their role and their work. How were they selected? I think that's a question that many people have. There was a, a very um, thoughtful and thorough uh, vetting process, an interview process. We had 30 people apply for these four positions. Uh, we had a committee that spent countless hours, uh, uh, countless hours making sure that we were selecting the right people. We're looking for folks who had credibility in the neighborhood that who are authentic and real representatives of the neighborhood. And so it took a lot of work. And on that committee, there were folks from my staff, Legislative Director Gretchen DeBacker played a key role, our human resources team, police uh, department was represented. But here I want to give a, a particular shout out and thanks to a gentleman who joined us here today, Reverend Willis from St. Paul's Missionary Baptist Church. Um, not just representing himself and his church, but the entire IMA, Interfaith Ministerial Alliance. He was the representative of that group uh, on this committee. I just cannot tell you how much, much time he contributed to this, and I'm just so thankful for your time and the fact that you're joining us here today. We, um, we're gonna turn it over here pretty soon to representatives of Cure Violence. These uh, two gentlemen standing uh, behind me are from Cure Violence. Um, they will be happy to you know, answer any questions, talk about um, the, the uh, theory behind it, the strategies behind it. Uh, Amir and Jermaine are extraordinarily talented individuals. Uh, they've been in our city all week. Uh, they're gonna remain here for a few more days uh, and they will uh, be happy uh, to talk with you. We're also going to introduce you to our violence coordinators, uh, three, three of whom are here. One is uh, just a little under the weather, not feeling well. Uh, I don't know that we, you should read any more into that. I don't think he's uh, camera shy. Uh, he, just, he just isn't feeling well. But uh, there will be four of them. As a general rule, and this is part of the cure violence uh, model and theory, um, not only are our violence interrupters not police officers who don't do police work, they're also not media celebrities. <laughs> and it, it, that's actually kind of important here. I think we're going to make an exception today. If you want to talk to them, that's fine. I don't think any of them are anxious to speak without being asked a direct question. If you want to, uh, but after today, the, the way this works, the theory here is that they're not going to be at the crime scene jumping in front of a camera, they're not going to be a source. Uh, for you, they're, they're, it's just different. Their job is to stay. They're not about being in the media. They're not about, you know, working with police. They are involving themselves in the lives of high-risk individuals in high-risk parts of Toledo in a way that we think make a difference. So I just, that's kind of a little procedural thing. If you want to talk to them, take advantage of today. Because <laughs> we're we're, we want to follow their rule. We don't want Cure Violence to get mad at us. Um, two other, I guess, little procedural things before I uh, turn it over. Um, the, the funding for this initiative um, uh, will come from ARP. I think um, that shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. The American Rescue Plan uh, clearly talks about evidence-based violence reduction strategies and the Mayor's Initiative to Reduce Gun Violence and the Save Our Community Program absolutely qualifies and there's simply no question that uh, the salaries and the costs and the logistics are going to be paid for uh, with the federal uh, relief money uh, that we are receiving from uh, Washington. This is called the Mayor's Initiative to Reduce Gun Violence. That's what Joanne is the director of. This particular component of it, this piece of it, we're calling Save Our Community. And I don't know if it's been handed to you or not. 
I would show you mine, but it has my little chicken scratch handwriting on it. Maybe I will have to rip it off, whatever. <laughs> How about I bend it like this? So this, this is what's going to go. This is the logo. This is what it's going to look like. The, so their work, uh, they're working with uh, under the Save Our Community banner underneath the larger Mayor's Initiative for New Gun Violence Program. I want to say that that logo uh, was designed by a, a Toledoan, a uh, young woman, talented graphic artist named Mercedes Culp. And I wanted to give her some credit for contributing to this cause uh, in that way. Um, what this part of the program is about is prevention and intervention. Uh, intervention and prevention. That's the part of the plan that we are working right now. And the Cure Violence trainers, again, like I mentioned, have been in Toledo all week, provided 40 hours of training to get these uh, violence interrupters out and in the community and doing their thing. And I am uh, thankful for them for stepping up to serve the community in this way. Um, it takes a special person uh, to want to do this. And it's going to take a community effort to solve the problem. Um, this, is, this is a problem that's happening everywhere. It's a problem um, so big that no uh, police chief or um, you know, uh, academic has been able to wave a magic wand and eradicate it. And anyone who claims that you know they can do this, you know, with by scratching a few ideas down on a napkin, is you know simply not being honest. This is hard work, and in order to do this right, we need to be thoughtful, we need to be collaborative, we need to follow data, and we have to embrace it as a community. Everyone in this community has a role in this. And what you see here uh, behind me is you know, the beginnings of our team uh, that is um, already making a difference and will continue to make a difference in this office. So I believe that's all I have to say. Do I turn it over to Juan or Juan is going to handle it? OK, that's yeah. it. Yeah. You're the boss. So. All right, thanks. So uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I, I'm, I'm extremely excited to be in this phase of our process. Um, again, it's been six months, and, and the wheels have continually been uh, moving. And so. Uh, with that, I also want to reiterate something that the, the mayor stated, that addressing violence as a public health issue, uh, these guys' jobs are, are three, three things. Uh, prevent the transmission, stop the spread, and change the norm. That is, that is their ideal responsibility. As the mayor stated, we only have three up here today. William Golden, uh, our fourth, is, is ill today. Uh, we also have Gerald Carter, um, Isaac Miles, um, and Lamisha Hudson, who will be the supervisor of our group. And so um, I'm, ex I'm extremely excited, again, to be in this phase of the process. Um, I'll be more excited once numbers start going down and we are proven to be effective with what we're trying to produce. Um, but with that, I want to introduce the guys from Cure Violence. We have Amir Ship um, and Jermaine Merritt. And, and Jermaine will give you some information regarding Cure Violence. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jermaine Merritt. I'm Program Coordinator and Implementation for Cure Violence Global. Um, I'll be brief as possible. Uh, Cure Violence Global uh, is a great organization in relation to changing the mindset of individuals who once was perpetrated with violence in their community. I'm a success story in relation to Cure Violence. Uh, today, make me being home from prison five years. Mm. Uh, without Cure Violence, I wouldn't have been able to be the success story I am for my community, not only through my community in Inglewood, in Chicago, but throughout the United States. Uh, we infect people with the positive behavior, with the positive attitude, with the mindset change. Individuals uh, from our community, our peers, they look to individuals like us that have been there and done that and been down that road and that have suitability with them to sit back and influence them to change. And that's how I am here right now today, and I made that change, that transition, and I'm able to influence others around the world. And we pass that training on to brothers and sisters in those communities throughout the world to change their environment. Influ individuals that's positive, individuals who are doing the correct thing. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to the one. So with that, um, and, and a compliment to these guys, it's been, um, we're on our third day of training. It's been an amazing experience. I, I have to be, you know, forthcoming with that. Um, I was always excited about the initiative, but actually hearing not uh, what we are trying to accomplish, but how we will get it done. And them being as intentional as they are. I've taken more notes in these last three days than I took four years of college. <laughs> and so it's just been an exciting experience. Um, and I'm extremely looking forward, uh, and, I, and I'm thankful for these guys for being here. I'm thankful for these two specifically, uh, just from what I've been able to learn and, and what 
you know, the engagement with the participants, their, their excitement, enthusiasm about it. I have nothing but uh, optimistic thoughts about what we will be able to accomplish. So with that, uh, Mayor. I guess I just wanted to point out Councilwoman uh, Sir Sandra McPherson's here. I want to just give her mm -hmm. uh, a little shout out for taking the time to be here. I think um, we're open for questions. The, they have been, these three have been trained well. They, and we told them, avoid the media. <laughs> Don't interact with them. But we are making a, a one day exception if we have questions for them. But no, that's, we're open to questions. Um, a typical day for a violent interrupter and outreach worker uh, is just basically engaging into the community, merging into the community. Um, the high-risk individuals in the community will be paying attention to who's in that community, right? And these individuals are suitable because they're from the community. They're not individuals who come from another town, another state. These are individuals who come from that community. They're suitable, and the community embraces them. So individuals, those high-risk individuals, are going to pay attention to their presence in the neighborhood, they're going to want to, you know, eventually change their lifestyle from they seeing how they do, how they move. In. And it's just an inspiration to see someone is doing something different opposed to the violent acts. So does that mean they'll be walking the streets? Will they be in restaurants? Like, wh what is that going to look like? We have a, a target area, and everything that's in that target area, hot spots, from liquor stores to um, lounges to abandoned buildings, wherever those hot spots at, where high-risk individuals at, those violent interrupts and outreach workers will be monitoring that area, engaging with those high-risk individuals. And the level of uh, engagement is in trust and developing those relationships is going to come from individuals they understand that they was once like them. So they're going to be able to really identify with individuals as outreach workers and violent interrupts because they're familiar with them. They're from that neighborhood. They might know that, okay, Jawan, he didn't change his life. They're influenced by that. They need individuals like us to sit back and say, here go my way out. Will they be in school buildings? I'm not sure. Okay. But it, is that typically part of your plan to put these folks in school buildings? Well, it depends on what, if they have uh, available. If they have a community center, they use a community center. If they have houses, it depends on what's available. Just bear in mind, the, their, the typical day is a is second shift, 4 to midnight, so it wouldn't be necessarily during the school day. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, an example of how this works in Chicago and in Englewood, for example, where you said you're from? Like an anecdote of how you saw this impact somebody's life, how you know you keep going back, keep making those relationships, and you watch somebody change and you watch see really made an impact. Um, I'm just curious, like a personal experience from yes, this is all new to us. So okay, yes, we uh, we we really consider ourselves the first participant, right? In order for us to influence anyone, we have to make sure we didn't change. So our day have to match our night. So once individuals see and identify that you've changed your life, they're inspired to change theirs. In reference to me myself, I was inspired by my program coordinator, uh, my national director. I saw that he changed his life. I bought into him. I didn't buy into the program until I bought into him as an individual. Mm -hmm. Once I bought into him as an individual, then I bought into the program. So with high-risk individuals, they see individuals who was once like them. They want to change their life. That's you know something they want to do. Don't nobody want to sit up here and be a, a violent individual and do things into the community that's negative, right? That's why we're at this point right now. We're doing our all and putting our life on the line to give it back to our communities because this is what we know that's going to make a lifestyle change. How do you quantify success? Do you look for stats to go down? What's success to you? It's data. We use data as uh, success, right? We sit back and analyze individuals that success. We sit back and talk with them. We dialogue with them. We pay attention to them. We listen to them. And as gradually go on, uh, organically, they just merge with you, and then they start changing their lifestyle. They start asking you about jobs and uh, career changes, and it just gradually happens organically. I, I guess, I, I, in this respect, like, do you want, do you feel the success if the homicides go down ten percent, twenty percent? Like, do you, do you have a figure to it per se? Yes, yes, we gauge everything. Um, homicides go down, shootings go down, a lot of things go down in the neighborhood because you got individuals out there who help to change the mindset. We catching things on the front end before it even happens. When an argument happened, and we right there to de-escalate that argument. We hunted all parties involved so it won't escalate into a shooting. How does your organization interact with gangs and members of leadership? We communicate with gangs. We communicate with uh, individuals in gangs and different organizations, etc. 
how, how receptive are they to your message? They receptive, uh, they're really more receptive because they know we're suitable for this job. They know that the individuals who we hire do not be individuals who didn't told anything that don't have any sex cases or things of that nature. So they emerge with us. They know it's in their best interest to change their mindset or they're going to still be part of the problem instead of getting locked up. But if they ever see individuals like me, such as SHIP, one in the recidivism rate, it doesn't apply to us, they want to be part of that. They want to do something different. Okay, can I actually ask a question? I'm yes. So sorry. No, no, I think it's for you. <laughs> you just made reference to not having sex, ca sex cases, whatever. Can you talk a little bit about what we're looking, not, not about these individuals, personally, but what you're looking for in a balance and offer. In other words, what can't you have in your background? Okay. What could you have in your background? I mean, like, t what, if 30 people applied, what were you looking for? All right. Um, well, first and foremost, individuals who um, align themselves with making statements with the police, right? That shows that you're not credible, right? In your community, the community, look at individuals, high-risk individuals, look at individuals who have told or who have done sex cases or do things with, um, with ladies and women, Individuals in the street do not respect that, right? So therefore, our staff can't have no association with individuals like that, right? We get the best of the best. Those individuals change their mindset, and that's no longer part of uh, the negative or the norm in the community. And we grab those individuals and train them up on the cure violence model and put them back in those same areas, and they infect others with that positive attitude. It's contagious, right? It's the, the violence is contagious, and the positive approach is contagious. So we win with the positive approach more so than anything. Well, one of the things that I learned from talking to Cure Violence folks is that it is okay if a violence interrupter, um, I think the phrase you used was, was in the life. Mm -hmm. It's okay if they were in the life in the past, but they can't still be in the life. Oh, no. Right? Oh, no. I mean, so that's, that's a, it's okay if the life, you, in some ways you're more credible right. if you were left, but, but there has to be a line drawn. You can no longer be in the life. Yeah, your day has to match your night, right, in order for us to, you know, move forward with things, right? right. Uh, because not only the community look at that, the participants look at that, yeah. and we feel some type of way about that, right? So the individuals we dissect and pre-screen, they're official individuals. And, you know, sometimes you have individuals slip through the cracks. But when you shake the tree, the leaves gonna fall and the branches will stay. For the most part, we've had a great success rate with this program and continue to have a great success rate. We're looking forward to the success rate that's gonna be here in Toledo. May I, ask, may I ask one of the interrupters if, if you could come up here, if you don't mind, just I mean, to... Can I ask my question first? Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I've been waiting for a little bit. Um, so for people who are new to this program, who might be a little bit skeptical, they're seeing it's coming into here, um, what would you say to them? What would your advice be to them as you guys are getting started and really just starting off? Uh, the skepticism, um, I understand to a degree, but here go us. look at us. This is a success story right here in front of you. Been home five years from prison. I got out of prison August 26, 2016. Since I've been home from prison, I've been working for Cure Violence four years now. I volunteered for six years while I was in prison. To be home, I bought my mother a house. I own a building. I have a business. And I work for a global organization. And I'm inspirational to individuals around the world. That's great. I'm inspired by individuals around the world. So when we go do trainings and do things of that nature, I'm inspired as motivation to me. You know, it's therapy for me. It's therapeutic to be around like-minded individuals. So that's great. So give them, give them a chance to have that same experience here in Toledo? Oh, yes. They got that same chance, right? They're just building. They're just getting the training to know how to execute effectively, right? You know, do more listening, so how to reflective listening, right? To know how to de-escalate situations, to know how to understand body language. We teach them all that in our training. And we do continually follow-ups with them every week on the phone. We constantly come down and visit and go to sites and walk the community and canvas the community with them. We are a part of them. Make no mistake about it. We have time for one or two more questions. Yeah, if I could get one, one of you folks up there, just your, your goals, what you want a day to look like, and what you think success looks like. If you could give us your name. My name is, <coughs> excuse me, my name is Isaac Miles. Um, the goal is, I think, what all of our goal is, is to bring down the, the gun violence that's in Toledo. Um, we are, we are well equipped. We've all been through the inner city. Myself, personally, I, I was on one side of the fence of violence, and now I'm on the other side trying to prevent it. Um, we, we train by, by the best people that can train us in this type of work. You know. Um, a lot of people, I 
think they're, I've been hearing a lot of people uh, discredit, it's so much violence that people don't know wh what to do, what, where to go about, how to go about it. The mayor put in an initiative so that we were trained by the best people so that we can have results. Um, I'm so passionate about this. I think just like everybody else in here, I want the best for the city of Toledo. So with my history in the streets, I have connections in the streets to where I can talk to the, the, the bigger guys in the streets who, are, who have powerful roles and let them know that we are all here to stop the, to stop the violence. And um, I'm, I was once that, and now I'm able to switch it up a little bit and, and bring them along with me and to, so that we can set, do the goal that we got at hand. So why do you think your message will stick as uh, other messages that may not have? Well, as far as Toledo go, I, I can't remember a time where there was any organization going into the inner cities or in the hoods trying to get people to do the right thing. Not only are we trying to stop the violence or, or bring down the violence number, we're trying to build productive civilians in society. We want to make sure that the, the, the people we, we reach in it don't just stop after a conversation. We 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 bringing them along and helping take them to success as as far as we can go, as far as they're gonna allow us to. So um, we are rewarded by it. I think it's the best feeling in the world to know that you can save a life. How are you feeling getting ready to get started on Tuesday? Is there something you're really looking forward to? Is there a component of the program that you're ready to initiate that you think is going to make a big difference knowing the streets of Toledo? I'm excited about all of it. Um, come Tuesday, I'm hitting the streets so hard, letting everybody know what we got going on. Like, come Tuesday, I'm, it's all I've been waiting on. This is my passion. I want, I want the best for my city. I think everybody in here should want the best for the city you live in here. So, um, I kind of feel as if I'm, my team, we, we special, you know. We we would have never had this opportunity, you know, with, with criminal records and, and and our backgrounds to get an opportunity to where we really impacted the way we're going to impact. You know, people are. Um, I've heard a lot of negative comments, but we not we not here for that. We just here to do our goal that we got set, and that's to to slow the violence down in Toledo. Would you like to say yeah. a couple words as well? And tell us your name, I apologize. All right, my name is Gerald Carter. Um, from our training that we've been going through this week, it's uh, we are targeting high-risk individuals. Those high-risk individuals are the individuals that's been involved in gun violence, shootings, murders, things like that. So the what we're here for is to turn these high-risk individuals to no-risk individuals. And I think that's about, that's basically what, what we're here to try to do. Would you like to last word today? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Lamisha Hudson, and um, I am here as a supervisor for the position. I'm really excited about it because um, I've worked in social services forever. I'm not going to age myself. Um, but <laughs> I've been in social services forever. And this is the first initiative that I've been a part of that actually takes people from the community and put them back into the community to help the community. And that um, is something that is completely different. The idea and the notion of approaching uh, the violence from a health crisis standpoint is also a different um, approach. And so this is all just a really phenomenal uh, opportunity, honestly. Um, I really am looking forward to seeing us, you know, make changes in the community. And I'm hoping that understanding that a person's past does not at all predict who they become. They can grow to be anything. So I'm hoping that this opportunity and this initiative can make more changes in the social service sector so we can see actual changes being made. I am curious, with what you just said, mm -hmm. um, are you hoping to change other people's mindsets as well who might Absolutely, judge? absolutely. Um, there are a lot of naysayers, and honestly, <laughs> there's nothing that I can say up here today that's going to change their mind. There's nothing that I can say. But I do feel that our outcomes will make that change. Yeah. 
So um, give us an opportunity. That's all I'm asking for is to give us an opportunity and see what outcomes come from taking a chance on the very people that we're trying to help. All right. I know there's a council hearing at one o'clock, so we'll. I think we ended just the right amount of time. We'll let this group get downstairs and do it again.